first of all, sort of thank you for, for coming on and doing this. I know you've got your own podcast going at the same time. Um, so it's nice to actually do some, some joint content. But um, first of all, I kind of wanted to get some insight because you're someone who does business within the UK and outside the UK. Um, I wanted to, I wondered if there was any sort of wisdom you could, you could pass on about how people could be improving what they're doing now. Um, and then I, I kind of want to, I want to touch on the present, but really focus on the future because I think everything that can be said about the present has been said and is already out there now. Um, so I think, you know, the big opportunity we've all got is to do some planning um, and to start focusing on what we could all be doing in the future and, and what the future might look like. So if that's all right with you, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of structure it that way. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, look, thanks for having me today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, yeah, I mean, come, firstly, uh, I think the way that um, people are going to change their working habits in the future is probably one to focus on. Um, I mean, we, funnily enough, what so I was saying about the, um, uh, the pitch that we're kind of getting ready for, um, you know, we're finding that most of our clients now, um, there's two things going on. One is they obviously can't do any face-to-face -face activity. And I think that's going to be something that I don't think it's going to be something that's going to get turned back on very quickly. I, mm -hmm. I sort of predict that um, CES will probably be cancelled as well. Yeah. Because um, if you think, and the thing that might stop it being cancelled is if a vaccine's found. Yes. And we all know that the UK are pioneering that and sort of, I think they started their live trials yesterday. For yeah. Human. It's in Oxford, just down the road from me. Yeah. Well, we're in the same neck of the woods, aren't we? Oh, of course. Yeah. You're Aylesbury, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, uh, I think if the vaccine happens, then I don't know, this may change, but, um, you know, companies are going to have to just completely rethink how they do their marketing because, you know, they've, they've been so institutionalized into going to, um, conferences, you know, all through the year to kind of address different parts of their market. And now it's all suddenly being taken away. So, you know, the marketing and the project launches still need to happen, but it's just kind of how that that sort of factors in. So we're finding that um, a lot of clients that we work with are now suddenly asking us to rethink what we're doing. So it's like, let's say with the pitch this morning, we spent, I don't know how long we spent doing this proposal and had a kind of an 18 month rollout planned um, for this particular product launch. But obviously some of the key milestones in that plan have now potentially been taken away. Yeah. So we're looking at, well, how do we, you know, how do we kind of replace, um, you know, replace those activities. I mean, the irony is that um, I actually think that by taking away um, the exhibitions, you know, it does free up quite a lot of budget mm -hmm. to do things. I mean, I know certain clients, I, mean, I don't want to name who, but I know one of them spends something like 2 million euros on a stand at IFA. Wow. That's just a stand, um, kind of getting that thing built. Now, if you, we were looking at, um, you know, a new way of uh, doing a digital launch uh, at Gamescom. So with Gamescom and with a media partner, getting influencers, even like a kind of, um, you know, a TV uh, celebrity who would kind of fit in the genre of what we're doing. Um, you know, when you add all that up, thinking they'll never sign this budget off, we're still looking at, you know, one eighth of what this particular client would have spent on their stand. Mm -hmm. And they would end up getting a much wider reach, a, you know, huge amounts of content you know something that would really kind of you know add value to their brand um and i think when companies kind of you know put two and two together and start to realize you know what uh, we've been spending all this money for years and actually you know we could be doing digital and really uh, you know really attacking exactly the market we want to go after with this spend and kind of learning iteratively just i just don't think that they're going to go back to you know the way they used to do marketing before and you know it kind of presents another problem for brands as well because i think they they potentially don't have the skills in-house to kind of manage this new type of marketing yeah because think of um traditional marketing managers you know they've been focused on and this is no you know no offense to marketing managers but you know if you've been focused on a particular type of marketing like you know a lot of these guys might be spending three months getting ready for EFA, or you know the same getting ready for EFA or ces and now suddenly, you know, those events could potentially be ripped out from underneath them. You know, they've now got to focus on something that they're only focusing 20% of their time on. So some of them, I'm sure, will adapt and learn on the move. But, 
you know, some of them just might really struggle with kind of, you know, what this new world looks like because they don't know themselves 50% of the things they could potentially be doing. So, you know, on that, yeah. Do, do you think a lot of people are making up, you know, the barriers that they're seeing are actually just barriers in their head then? Because it does make sense if you've only been spending, you know, 20% of your time on the thing that's the only available option now, which is social and digital and, and, and things that are online. Um, the barriers to entry that people seem to think are in front of them, are they actually just missing, you know, a bit of a skills gap? Yeah, I just think they don't, some of them just don't know what they don't know. I mean, that's yeah. the problem. So they are, they're kind of getting a bit stuck potentially because when they all these traditional things have been taken away from them, they don't know what they can be doing. And that, you know, it's a problem. I mean, I know, um, you know, I've been running, I'm a bit older than you and I've been running my agency for, you know, nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you kind of look at the various stages of how the agency's developed, you know, I see it within agency as well. So yeah. you know, when we first started 20 years ago, we were a sort of pure media driven agency, you know, very kind of old school, all about taking journalists out, getting them drunk, getting the relationships built, you know, and that's what our clients were paying for, those relationships that we had with client, with, with media. You roll it on 10 years and you've suddenly got, you know, the, you know, the kind of formation of digital, uh, because don't forget, when I started in PR, we didn't even have the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a phone and you met people. And, you know, Friday afternoons were great. We never worked on Fridays. It was kind of <laughs> like to get drunk and pee Monday sometime. You know what? I was talking to Chris Taylor about this um, from XNA the other day. He was talking about how uh, when he was at Sony, there was no such thing as the internet. So any customer query came via handwritten letter and they were dictated into a dictaphone, given to a secretary, typed up as a reply, given back to him to sign, and then sent to the postman. <laughs> you can imagine a world where we would, you would send a press release out, and the client wouldn't bother you about coverage until about three months later. Yeah. Because that was the cycle of, you know, of media. You know, now, you send the press release out, the client's, you know, expecting a report in 10 minutes. Yeah, it's instant, isn't it? Instant. Why isn't it on whatever? And it's like, you know, and I get that, and it's fine, but it's kind of, that was, you know, we were used to working, and, you know, was, everything's just getting shorter and shorter all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, my point before about, you know, skills, so you got 10 years ago in my agency, people are starting to integrate digital, or digital starting to become, you know, um, we're aware of it. So things like, you know, Facebook are appearing, um, Twitter's appearing, um, you know, websites are appearing a bit more, you know, people are starting to um, develop their websites a bit more. Because I used to do the, um, I don't know if you know this, but I did the PR for Macromedia, which was Flash and Dreamweaver. Oh, right, okay. My law, you know, with Macromedia, I was the agent working on the account within the agency that had Macromedia. So we won that account and launched Flash. I think it was Flash MX and Dreamweaver MX, I think it was called at the time. Mm -hmm across Europe see so yeah, that's fun um but yeah so you get to the point where you know you've suddenly got all these old school PR people uh having to start to learn digital skills and there is an enormous amount of pushback because suddenly you've got well you know I do media I don't do digital and it's kind of you know you roll that on to now you know our expectation when we hire people is that they know all of this stuff you know, and they can't just say, I only do social media, I only do influencers, I only do, you know, video content, because, you know, as a communications person, they need to do all of it. And I've seen the struggle to get people to that point, because, you know, I think they finally had to, you know, stop thinking that they're specialists when they work in a comms agency and start to learn everything. And I think within brands, they're going to have to go through that whole process a lot quicker, because now everything's just been ripped away. They're now all about digital. And they've got to suddenly learn on the job or not keep their job, I think, is what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen how fast as well a lot of technologies have been accelerated. You know, the amount of people who are now using things like Twitch and the fact that TikTok almost felt like it came out of nowhere to take over. And there's all this new short form content to make. And, and really, it's nothing new, but, but it seems like such a huge gap to sort of jump over and um a new skills uh, new skills for creating content that need to be learned um and i think people are maybe a little bit intimidated by that because especially if you've been doing traditional like you say and you suddenly jump into a digital space that you remember as being facebook and twitter and it's completely different to that now isn't it yeah and it doesn't mean they can't do it but it's like even i would struggle 
you know, if I suddenly had to go into, you know, an account and start to, I don't know, do all their Facebook ads and start to analyze it and, you know, I wouldn't really know what to do. And it's kind of, yeah. you know, and that's what we're going to expect, you know, brands are going to expect. It's, um, by the way, with TikTok, I um, I want to get your opinion on this. I I sit there and watch TikTok with my kids sometimes. And yeah. The content on there, it's like hilarious. Yeah, yeah. How they come up with this stuff. It's like what? Like, I mean, it's like they're all on, you know, class A drugs. <laughs> <laughs> with this just like insane stuff. And it's, but it's like, you know, I just find that, you know, because we've obviously got, you know, YouTubers and, um, you know, video that's done on Instagram and stuff like this. But I don't know what it is about TikTok videos, but they're just very, very good and creative, some of them. You know what it's like? It's it's like a new version of hashtags. Uh, and this is a kind of a weird analogy, but there's loads of trends. So have you, there's, there's like a Drake song and everyone emulates the Drake song because there's a dance that you follow, which you may have seen. I learned this dance, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or there's a section of a song or there's certain, there, there's a bunch of people who um, uh, voice over movie quotes. So they, they mine movie quotes and things like that as well. So it's almost like, the video version of a hashtag. It's like, it's a trend that everybody follows and, and your video gets added to the pile of people emulating Wolf of Wall Street or, you know, yours. You're, you get added to the pile of people doing the Drake dance and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and it is really clever. And a lot of people, it gives a, a lot of people a lot of create, creativity because effectively, let's, let's be honest, it's an Instagram story, isn't it? It's a, it's a portrait video that lasts yeah. for about 15 seconds. It's, it's a, you know, it's an Instagram story. But the difference is that the age group is different. So people on Instagram, you would never post yourself dancing to a Drake song in your Instagram story. However, people seem to have this habit and, and it's something in the mind that says, okay, but it's okay to post it here because it's relevant on TikTok. Um, the content pillar is, ne- is pretty much still the same um, and making it is pretty much still the same, but there's just something about TikTok and the way they've created the culture in their audience that everyone is far more creative and far more willing to post something authentic and, and maybe even sometimes a bit embarrassing. Um, but it's an interesting space to look at, that's for sure. Yeah, it just embodies like, you know, this current sort of state of social where, you know, I think even TikTok as a platform has developed almost as quickly as something that's viral on TikTok. Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because even I, I, you know, I'm in a, what, I mean, I'm sort of mid forties. And um, I'm on Inst- WhatsApp groups with, you know, various friend groups. And even like, you know, the older guys that, you know, I'm good, some, some dads at um, my kid's school, they're sending me TikToks on WhatsApp that they've obviously <laughs> sent from their kids or something. So, um, yeah, very funny. Well, I think, you know, what the other funny thing about this is how many conversations have you had with other parents about your kids watching? I don't know if your kids do this, but kids watching gamers play games. Yeah on YouTube. How hilarious is it that now the whole world is watching F1 drivers play F1 games and that's their entertainment. Yeah. And yeah. it's happened It's happened in like the flick of a switch. Uh, and it's so funny, like a few months ago we were taking the mick out of, oh, how stupid is it watching another kid play, another, play a game? And literally the whole world has to do it now. It's, it's really the irony of it, it's hilarious. Yeah, what I love about those F1s is like some of the old drivers, is it uh, Johnny Herbert and um, mm. some of the others are racing in there as well. They're still just as good as the new guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think sim racing, and I've had this conversation um, already, and I would like to chat with you about esports actually, because you are very involved with it at Ranieri. And um, I've, I've had the conversation with a few people about how close sim racing is very entertaining because the technology is so close to the real thing. You know, it's not like watching football players play FIFA. You know, these guys are actually sitting in, in some cases, thousands of pounds worth of kit, and, and it's almost yeah. like driving a real car. Um, you know, and there's maybe an opportunity after this for young drivers who've been doing well in sim racing to then move up to something like Formula 4. And I think that's really interesting about how we're laughing about, you know, the fact gamers, people are watching gamers play games that has now become our version of sport while we're in this period. And then it may, it may then flip back to how it was before, but a few of the gamers actually doing the real sport. Um, yeah, hasn't, this already, hasn't this already happened though with um, Nismo? Yes. yes. Were, yeah. Know, like Le Mans or something. Yeah, it was actually Kieran Morris at Sling, uh, Slingshot. He was working for Nissan, I believe. Uh, it, it, was on our, it was on our podcast, we talked about it. Um, yeah, it was the kid who was driving the Nismo sim. He did Le Mans 
um, in the first ever electric car. I don't think they finished the race, but it was certainly a massive step forward. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, I, um, my first experience of this, obviously, because I'm, you know, Ranieri has a gaming division, as you know, and there's lots yeah. of gaming specialists within the division. And we're actually starting to do the comms for some esports teams, mm-hmm. uh, which, again, is something that, um, is, I mean, it's all new to me because I'm, I'm not a gamer. But um, two years ago, I went to, or last year, I went to E3 and just started to watch some of the esports, um, you know, tournaments in E3. And it's quite staggering, you know, the, the, I mean, the people that are involved in those tournaments. I mean, there's like university teams that are kind of, I think they're almost making as much money as like the football teams in the universities. Um, they've suddenly got this sort of cult following. Um, you know, that wasn't, uh, what was it, the guy that won, uh, the kids under 11 that won a million quid on Fortnite? Yeah, it was, uh, it was the biggest um, sporting purse ever, apart from things like UFC. It was the biggest prize money ever offered for a sport. So it's more than Wimbledon, you know, more than Masters. Yeah. And he was 11. <laughs> and at that time, there was a whole bunch of, um, like, uh, parenting questions being asked. Yeah. You've suddenly got a kid who's amazing at Fortnite, and he plays Fortnite, like, eight hours a day. I mean, my kids certainly aren't allowed to play, you know, video games for eight hours a day. But suddenly you're in a position where, you know, like, the, the mother's suddenly, you know, parent of the year because her son's won the fortnight but basically she's ignored him for five years <laughs> like, but do yeah you, so, do you think there's a um a feeling amongst parents who kind of watch this you know who, who are aware of the esports world who maybe think they're robbing their kid of an opportunity you know because if you think about it if cristiano ronaldo's mother made him go to school and not play football eight hours a day you do you think there might be a um, a thought in some parents' minds that am I doing the same thing? But because I'm not used to the gaming scene. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm probably the, of the generation which has crossed both worlds. Yeah. So when I was young, you know, we didn't have any of this stuff. Um, you know, my parents used to drive us to Italy once a year because my background's obviously Italian. You know, I'd been in a car for two days without an iPad and no air conditioning, and driving down, you know, the auto route in Italy. <laughs> 40 degree heat and the window open was you know that was the thing that got me through it you got really good at ice spy then <laughs> yeah, now my kid can't walk across the kitchen without turning on an ipad or listening to that idiot more yeah um yeah so it's kind of it's definitely the whole but i think you know back then we would watch saturday afternoon tv we watched like i don't know the 18 night rider whatever it was now the kids are watching their own content that you know they're creating for themselves that they're then watching for themselves you know back in the old days i mean we were you know when you're thinking about it we're watching um like the 18 take an example so when my son was he's 11 i was probably 11 watching the 18 you know you're watching grown men walking around shooting each other well exactly yeah now we're complaining about you know first person shooter games like what's the difference you know yeah really it's just well, yeah. Even, even when I was kids, that's what I was doing in the park. You were picking up a stick and shooting each other. <laughs> that's pretty much what me and my friends did in the woods. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, kids, I mean, they still, we were watching TV back then and they're watching gaming now. I mean, I do think that it's getting a little bit out of control where people are watching too much stuff. Like, yeah. you, it, you know, I can definitely see, you know, formations of an addiction in my kids mm-hmm. by the way they kind of, are walking around with their tablets and kind of, you know, they don't realise they're doing it. And that's the thing. I mean, you can, you know, you can sort of see it. You know, they're just sort of, you know, it's hard to get them off it to go to bed. You know, they wake up, you come down in the morning, they've already turned on like a tablet to watch YouTube. It's like, it's very getting very difficult to police. And that's, that's the thing that worries me. It's just kind of, you know, you roll it on to the next generation and just like, I don't know, the, at what point, do they start, you know, go looking outside and stop looking at screens, you know, because they're going to do a whole lot of stuff as well? Yeah, well, I think especially now, considering the circumstances, it is literally the window to the outside world. I think that's the problem. We're going to have a few months of that is the only option. Yeah. And now, like, you know, I spend my life trying to get them off tablets. 
and now they're doing virtual learning on their bloody screens from school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's not going to help the situation. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, the thing is as well, the, um, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if you, you haven't got kids, have you? No. no, 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 not yet. But like, so they're doing their virtual learning at school and then, you know, they'll then call each other on Teams and just then have their social interaction over Teams. So it's kind of, and when they're, when they're not doing any of that and having some downtime, they're watching YouTube. It's yeah. like really hard to sort of at the moment keep them away and I really worry at the moment they're spending you know they're going to almost create a dependency on screens that they then won't it'll be hard to kind of break when we do get out of lockdown yeah but if you think about it though how different is that to my day or your day yeah I mean literally I used to get thrown out of the house into the garden door locked and like eight hours later I was let back in yeah but what but what i'm saying is um, our day as of today so you know the first thing i do when i wake up is turn on my phone and then then my computer call call i'm calling you through through zoom now i then will probably go and watch something on netflix later and be on my phone until i fall asleep i i think you know i i totally i i can totally see you know the argument for a parent and a child but at the end of the day i think even the adults right now are, are doing exactly the same pattern and I, and I think that's probably why it's been followed by the next generation, because it is just what life is like at the moment. Yeah, I do worry about. That. I mean, I get that you know it's the it is of the moment, but I do think that um, I don't know the the content that's out there. I mean, particularly YouTubers that I'm aware of that I hear quite a lot from coming from my kids' iPads. But it's just it's, some of the stuff is just I just feel like it's destroying their brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't like to use this word, but it's well, I'm not going to use it. But they, it's just like these people, like they are. It's like they're doing pranks mm -hmm. that aren't really that funny. Yeah, they're kind of you know going in and like buying I don't know like burgers for 24 hours from McDonald's drive-throughs. They're like you know giving away um, or going into a store because they're nicking their mum's credit card and going into a store and buying like iPads and iPhones and it's all obviously a stage. You can see it's staged. Yeah. There's another one that's um, I can't remember the name of it now, um, but basically it's like you know like the dark web, but mm -hmm. it's like a kid's version where oh, he's said we've got to save YouTube before these people are going to shut it down. But if you subscribe and buy his T-shirts, it will help him against like this thing. And all these kids are like buying his merch to basically stop you. And I'm like, Gabriel, think about it. Like, he's you know he's not going to shut YouTube down because that's how he makes his money. Yeah. So massive, but they, but it, it is fun. Like it's kind of, but it's fun and it's not fun. But it, you know, I just it, the the content is just it's not like you know a good old sort of I don't know like program that's been well thought out and it's got humorous and it's you know got some kind of class about it it's just you know absolute idiots you get you know what though you get sucked in because i've i've i had exactly the same thoughts about there was a guy who um watches Fortnite. um my partner's my partner's um nephew he, he watch he can watch it eight hours a day if he was allowed probably more um, and I, I sat there and I was like, what on earth are you watching? Because it's an Australian guy who's just banging on about what's happening in the game and making funny noises. Um, and I, I was like, what is this? And he put it on the TV while I was working. And I honestly did find myself, uh, whether it was because it was annoying or what, but I was looking over my laptop and I found myself for, for periods of, I, I wasn't thinking at all, but I'm staring at the TV for like 20 minutes at a time. <laughs> and, then, and then forgetting what I was working on. I was like, oh my God, it's almost like it brainwashes you. But you, you do get drawn in and you do end up just, because it's easy to watch, mindlessly watching it. You realise as well that it's kind of, it ends up, tell, you know, it's choosing what to watch next for you. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're sort of watching the videos and then suddenly the next one's playing and it's kind of, so it's taking you on its own journey as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. The algorithms have got an excellent, it's almost like when you watch Netflix though, isn't it? You know, you binge watch a series. YouTube yeah. will literally binge watch the next related series for you. The other thing I found the other day was um, my next door neighbours came for a drink on our drive the other day, obviously respecting social distances. <laughs> yeah. uh, he brought with him uh, this thing called a fat boy, you know, the big... Yeah, yeah, things. the big chair, yeah. Yeah. And um, what I found staggering, I suddenly realised that 
everywhere I look on my social platforms are adverts for the fat boy. Yes, you know why that is? Um, it's because you, you, you will receive retargeted ads based on what your friends are searching for. It so seems, it's, it's like Big Brother is watching, isn't it? <laughs> like he brought the thing to my drive, the next day, how did they know he brought it to my drive? Well, it, it won't be. It won't be the. Um, it won't be the chair in itself. It may be that you or your wife has either messaged them on Facebook or talked to them or commented or liked or checked in in some way, and then based on what he's searching for, you'll have been served an ad. You'll have probably been searched served a hundred ads. It's just that you won't have noticed ninety nine of them. It'll just be one of them that you, you remember. That's true. I just find it like that's the first time I've looked up and went. Yeah. Why am I getting ads for that? I mean, I've literally been on my drive. <laughs> I, I mean, I might be wrong. They might be looking at you from a drone somewhere up in the sky. But um, I, I've, I, I know about, you know, it's my job to kind of know about some of this stuff. And even I get weirded out many, many, on many occasions. Lisa, did, my wife, did tell me that um, she searched for it. Mm. But it was on her computer, not mine. I've got separate stuff. But That's if you're why I've got more... Yeah, if your friend's on Facebook, though, obviously, yeah, that, that's how it, how it serves it. It can, it can base it on Lisa's search terms. And because you two are connected on social or on Facebook, it can serve it to you as well because it, it realises that you're within that core audience of mutual friends or mutual family with her. Yeah, I mean, that was incredible. Whoever's doing Fat Boys, like, retargeting, they're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, I, I, often, I often go, God, that's scary, but I'm quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I get because I, I obviously through my job I'm researching clients and prospects and stuff like that and it can be quite annoying when you know you've just kind of spent your know, heart and soul trying to do a pitch for somebody you lose it and then you then continually get ads for their product for the next <laughs> <laughs> yeah that really rubs salt into the wound doesn't it yeah it's like yeah I know it's good screw you <laughs> <laughs> I know it's good that's why I was pitching for it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can we, um, can we move on to, um, I know we were talking about YouTube. Can we talk about influencer for a second? Because I'm seeing stuff all over the place and I've got my own opinion on this, but I'm interested in what you think. I'm seeing loads of white papers, loads of blogs and stuff about how the influencer bubble is going to burst. I mean, this has been a story over and over again over the last three years since influencer has ever been a thing. Do you think that um, this whole period of lockdown is, is going to burst or are influencers actually innately in some way of a better position? Uh, I think that um, in the early days, influencers uh, charged way too much money. Um, mm. And, you know, if you can get it, you can get it. I mean, I think did, people didn't really understand it. Um, and they thought that, you know, they could just get an influencer to mention something and, you know, job done. I mean, I've seen stuff where I worked on a startup brand um, called Yubble, which was supposed to be a competitor to WhatsApp. Um, which was, you know, it was funded and uh, we didn't organise it, but they used KSI. Mm -hmm. And all he did was mention Yubble within the middle of a video. And I think he got paid something like 150K for it. Um, and like, it did absolutely nothing. Like, you know, didn't move the needle at all. Um, you know, and there was a lot of that going on. I think influencers now are you know, there's huge amounts of them. And the, the struggle that we have now is kind of working out which influencers to use for which campaigns yeah. and trying to make sure we know that there are, we a hundred percent know that influencers are of value to a comms campaign, but it's now trying to find the right balance between, you know, all your kind of content creation, using influencers to create content and get it out there and what the kind of balance should be. Mm -hmm. I think with everything becoming much more digital, I mean, I do think that influencers, A, will kind of, there'll be a lot more of them um, just because, you know, I think inherently there's going to be more influencers just kind of developing. Um, it's kind of eating up into the sort of more traditional medias, you know, um, usual sort of uh, market because basically, it's like I was saying this before, I mean, kids are growing up now not looking at media they're looking at YouTubers and their social accounts for kind of information. I just think that, you know, it's going to balance out where influencers are definitely not going away. They're really important and, you know, it's part of a comms mix, but I think they're going to have to start working for their money. 
Yeah, yeah. I think I think as, as an influencer, you've got to you've got to change the way you're thinking. And I think this this period of time now is a perfect time to do it because if you think about it logically, there isn't a single brand out there at the moment who can do a photo shoot or a video shoot for a product or a demonstration, really, unless you know the, the product manager at home is going to do the demo himself, but he doesn't have an audience. And I think the big the big um, opportunity for influencers right now is if there are brands out there that do have a product launch coming up that they can still launch, i.e. if it's a new game or a new piece of tech, they can use an influencer to basically create their video um, demo or they can create their promotional video because it's, it's not like you can call, call up someone like Momentum, like ourselves, to go out and grab all your products and film you a great product series or a demo. Um, and that's the way influence should be, influencers should really be being used at the moment. Um, but I think, like you say, they haven't, the influencers themselves haven't cracked the idea yet of breaking out of the, I'll just get paid for putting one post out. You know, they, they, they need to change the way they actually work themselves to win that brand budget. Yeah, I mean, there's two things there. One is, I mean, we're getting, we actually won a client um, a few weeks ago, a Korean client, and they're only doing influencer activity. Yeah. which is interesting. So we've got a budget to kind of use some sort of micro-y type influencers to review products in a sort of gaming situation because they feel that that's the way to go. So mm -hmm. they're not even considering like media and stuff anymore. I don't, I mean, I personally think you should have a balance of, you know, you still need to do some media comms, you still need to do some influencer work, we still need to create some of our own content and kind of balance it out. Mm -hmm. um, I think the problem, the problem with influencers is they've come from a lot of them have come initially from just kind of becoming popular on like youtube for example they yeah. weren't kind of business people before um and what they've done is they've kind of got on this sort of bandwagon a bit of thinking right well i've got loads of subscribers so therefore i should be paid loads of money mm -hmm. and then they also then demand their money immediately and it's kind of like i think it's almost they've it's a bit like, well, you know, someone's going to pay me this money. Shit, I better get paid quick before they come to their senses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think the ones that are going to kind of succeed are going to start to put the two and two together to realise that, you know, the influencers, just like media have done over the years, you know, that media, influencers, brands, they're all in this sort of ecosystem where they all feed each of, of each other. Mm -hmm. At the moment, some influencers, not all influencers, but some influencers are putting themselves as the kind of on top of that pile, or yeah. actually everyone is equal within this ecosystem, you know, because media need information from PR people. PR yeah. need to have brands to kind of work for, to give it to the media. You know, the influencers, you know, won't get paid unless the brands are supported and are making money. And kind of all this stuff kind of goes on. And it's once the, the influencer becomes a bit, a bit more kind of business savvy, and they understand that they need to work with brands, they need to work with their agencies to kind of do, you know, to create really good work, kind of, you know, do follow up, understand, you know, what worked and what didn't. Because there is a kind of, you know, influencers create their content their way for their channel, which I totally get. But they should also be doing that bit of 360 analysis to go back to the brand. You know, did the brand get value from it? And what can I learn for next time? You know, just like we would do as an agency, you know, we would ask our clients, you know, has this client been? Has this campaign been successful? What worked? What didn't? What can we approve for next time? You never really get that from influencers. It's kind of more, here's my content. Where's my cash? Yeah. <clears throat> Not I, I, I think it. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's a very, it's always a very short term relationship. And the influencers that I know that succeed really well, and hopefully in the next week I'm going to have a couple of them on the podcast as well to talk about this. Um, the influencers that succeed are the ones who are more business savvy and they, rather than trying to find the next cash, they're doing what you say and reviewing everything and making that relationship last longer. Because ultimately, if you were an influencer, you've got no security if you just do everything short term. Uh, I've yeah. done this, I've done this myself, you know, one month you can make thousands of pounds, the next month you can make 400 quid. Uh, and if you, if you do the, uh, review of everything and keep that client relationship going you know you're going to give yourself security and, and that's especially going to be needed in times like these yeah i mean I, if it was me I, you know and i was an influencer i would rather than trying to make you know 100 grand in one hit 
you know, and then never see me again, like, you know, KSI and that Yubble thing. I mean, you know, he did well. He got 150 grand and never heard from him again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I was an influencer now, I'd be like, well, okay, if your budget's, I don't know, 25K, how can we work like a longer program where we get paid over a period of time and work with each other to create content that works for you? And like meets your KPIs and you know does what needs to be done because then you've got a lot an ongoing relationship. You can then get you can almost become like your own little agency where the product is yourself. Well, exactly. Yeah. You're kind of you know and you're building you know some longevity in what you're doing, and then suddenly the brands are going to be like, yeah, I want to work with this guy because or, or girl, um, you know, because you know they're they're thinking about what's best for the brand. They're not just trying to get in, take it. I mean, I you know you've got to look at. Um, the business model of some of this as well, what's going on. I mean, it's like, you know, there's a lot of agents in between and, you know, agents, um, you know, there are some good ones out there, but there are also ones that are just really pushing, you know, an influencer to get a contract signed. So they get their 20%. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They don't really care about a six months campaign. They don't really care about the brand. You know, it's kind of, they are just there to make quick money because, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the agents at some point, you know, when the influencers wake up, and start to build relationships with brands directly and like agencies that work for those brands, you know, they don't need the agents. No. And I do feel quite strongly about that because I think agents get in the way a lot of the time. And yeah. I I, no friends saying that, but you know, <laughs> we know full well that they're taking a margin and they're separating us from the influencer. And it, it kills the creativity. Like we could get a lot more out of the influencer in the campaign and the brand could get a lot more if there was a lot more direct contact. But the, yeah. the agent doesn't like that because once we've got the relationship, what does the agent need? What does the agent do? Exactly. I, I've, I've witnessed this firsthand as well because I, I did a little bit of Instagram influencing, if you call it. Um, and I, I've still got the platform, um, but I just don't use it as much now. Um, but certainly, and it, it puts another step in the process that's not needed. I think a lot of the time it also, <clears throat> it can, it can put a lot of delay in, between getting briefs done and, and delivering content, getting reviewing the content. Cause obviously if you're as the influencer reviewing a content with the agent and then the agent's reviewing it back to the brand, there, there's this huge step in the middle. That's basically just like you say, it could just be worked straight through and, and done directly. And I, I tended to try and do things direct as much as possible because I kind of got it. But I think a lot of people who aren't as business minded don't. And, and it, an agent is just to them a safe expert that they can trust to make sure that they get money. And it's not always the case. It's certainly not always the case. Yeah, because the agent's not even, it's not like you need the agent to find the influencer. We already know which influencer we want to work with and we have to go through the agent to use them. Yeah, exactly. So all they've done is managed to sign up the influencer on a contract that says you can't do anything without me getting 20%. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And it's on the premise that, you know, because I, I was offered a few back in sort of in the last few years. And at, at first you kind of go, oh, yeah, actually, it'd be really good because you're looking for a guide, basically. But, but what I soon realized is if I just do the research myself, I was like, oh, it's not so difficult. But I think a lot of people who don't take that step they do it because it feels safe. Um, and yeah. you, you feel like you've got someone to guide you through this, what at first seems like a confusing industry to navigate, but actually it's, it's, not, it's not as confusing as it first seems. Yeah, but if you also look at the foundation of how this happened, you know, you've got like a YouTuber who's just creating content because it's a laugh. Mm -hmm. So he's got, you know, 500,000 subscribers. An agent comes to him and says, I've got this brand that wants to give you 100 grand. Um, but I'll, you know, I'm... I'm going to keep 20% for doing all the business side of it. You just need to sign this contract. Yeah. You know, who wouldn't turn down 80K when you've just been like in your bedroom playing Fortnite? Exactly. Well, it's the same model as sports, isn't it? You know, a guy gets talented at football and an agent comes along and says, I'll get you into a Premier League team over the next few years, but I've got to take 20% of whatever salary you make. It's, it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, you, you're, you jump at the chance, but then actually you're kind of signing yourself to you know i've seen it with brands as well i mean i think um there was like boots i think signed they sign like um you know like there was some hair products that uh, my wife used to work on but they end up so the boots will give them a contract for like an exclusive deal 
mm. where they sell their product, but actually they're just basically restricting themselves to selling in one retailer yeah. for the next however many years. So when they've got nothing and they're like, you know, a brand that's come out of nothing and suddenly Boots offers them this contract that says we're going to stock your product. It seems like a lot of money at the time, but then suddenly when, once they've started selling, you know, the next step is where else can I sell? But they can't because they're mm. signed up to this, you know, it's like, it's ridiculous. Boots are laughing. Yeah, it's always it's always that same problem as well, isn't it? You kind of you need that first big break, but then you often end up outgrowing the break before the contract ends, don't you? And yeah. It happens time and time again. You know, winning a big client, but then that client says, right, you can't work for anyone else now. Mm. Yeah. Do do you think that um there's going to be a bit of a resurgence of this though, when people start trying to monetize Twitch and well, they're not monetizing Twitch, they're already doing that. Start trying to monetize um, TikTok because I think it's people do this when they don't understand something and they just go, yeah, this is a big break. You know, we, we want to, we, we know that all the attention is on this platform. We don't really know what the platform is about, but we want to throw some money at it. Do you think this is where all these contracts get put in place and people almost, they do the move because they think they need to, but they don't really know why. Yeah, I know um, our influencer guy internally was pushing the Twitchers, sorry, the TikTokers um, probably would have been a year ago, just basically saying all these TikTokers at the moment, are char they were charging like, you know, tens of pounds. Mm, yeah. I think. And I think what's, you know, I think, every, you know, as agencies, we all understand the value now of influencers and kind of, how they can be integrated into campaigns and kind of what we should be paying. Cause there's now lots of kind of, you know, data from, you know, Instagram, YouTube, like what these people are worth and kind of, you know, what their, what their potential is. Um, so I think, you know, the people in the industry kind of know what they're worth, but TikTokers, again, there's probably a bunch of them that are suddenly getting popular that are going through this journey of being signed up by agents and, yeah, exactly. It's it's almost it's almost like a catch twenty two, isn't it? Like TikTok is still currently just about mass reach and, and mass eyeballs, much like Facebook was in or whenever it was two thousand and eight, and much like Instagram was a few years ago. But it almost seems like these platforms go through the same cycles. They have a wide open algorithm where you can reach millions and millions of people at the same time, and brands jump on it. And then as it starts getting monetized, that gets brought down and down and down and yeah. tapered. Um, and yeah, it happens. It happens every time. And I, I put money on that happening. And it probably is happening already um, on TikTok. And I know it's already happened on Twitch. And it's it's the same story. Yeah. I mean, it's like a, the other thing as well is, um, you know, it's uh, you've just got this um, whole bunch of people who are from all walks of life. And you know, us sat here as agency people understand the value. But all these people, you know, they might be, I don't know, a student or um you know a 11 year old kid uh all sorts of things you know they just don't understand the value in what they've got um and if someone offers them some cash and just says it's almost like you know you've been discovered by someone giving you a contract like the football yeah. thing it's um it's just, it's just going to keep repeating itself and i'm sure there'll be another platform that everyone will then jump onto because you know as each generation comes through you know it's like now uh you know like my, my my kids aren't on Facebook, but all they're interested in is YouTube and TikTok. Yeah, exactly. So when they have kids, I'm sure it'll be another platform. And like probably within you know, the time they're at school, there'll be other platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, for uh, sure. Yeah. I, I think everyone understands the value of attention, but not everybody understands what attention really is. But, you know, everyone, everyone understands the value of loads of people seeing something, but they don't necessarily understand what types of people are seeing it or, or what the value of an 11 year old seeing your ad for something that an 11 year old would never buy. <laughs> um, um, sorry, go no, no, it's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say when my kids were young, this is when I really started experiencing YouTube for the first time. Um, we're not experiencing it, but sort of, sort of seeing how these trying to understand some of the numbers. Cause my, my Gabriel when he was young, which was, you know, he's 11 now. So this is like, he was two, three, whatever it was. He was watching these YouTube videos of like uh, this crazy dude opening packets of sweets and chucking them on a table. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It's quite mesmerizing. But to a kid like, you know, basically he'd be opening like massive bags of Skittles and, but then, and it was all going onto a table and he was just like making these silly noises and stuff. 
I was looking down at the numbers and there was like, you know, 33 million views. Mm. And there's obviously ads on there. And you're just sat there thinking, you know, because the thing is that all the people watching these videos are like toddlers. So you've got all this money being paid by brands, you know, being repaid to the, you know, the guy creating these videos and not one penny of it is any value. Well, those three cards aren't going out and buying stuff. The other thing, the, the interesting thing with YouTube is YouTube will, put, much like, in fact, I think all platforms do it. I, I know Facebook does, but YouTube will also pay them based on their views for the, for the pre-roll ads and how many um, eyeballs are on there. Not because of who's watching it, but for the legacy of the people watching it. So even if it's a toddler watching it, that toddler is going to grow up. And if, if the people on YouTube can keep the toddler watching YouTube as they grow up to a purchase age, and it's, you know, it's a bit cynical thinking, thinking of it that way, but that's kind of the, the model behind it. It's, you know, get these, pay these influencers to keep putting out this content so that the pre-roll ads have been watched. Maybe for the first few years of their life, they're not worth watching. But as the person stays on the platform and gets older, it's that legacy of someone starting to watch at, at four or whatever and getting to a point where they're now a teenager and can, can badger their parents to buy something that they've seen on a pre-roll ad. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll have to... Uh... One of the same types of ads are on the same videos that they watch now. Then, yeah, it'd be interesting to do a bit of a bit of research on that actually. Um, yeah. But it is that legacy of they may be served something that's not for a child at the start. It might be something that you know because if if they are a really young toddler, yes, it's a toddler watching the video, but the likelihood is there's a parent sitting on their shoulder. Yeah, I suppose the other confusing thing for the algorithms is that they're probably logged into my YouTube account. Yeah, that's that'll be a factor as well. Yeah, so I, my profile look, must look really messed up. <laughs> yeah, because of course, because there'll, there'll be all of your, um, like you said about your client research, they'll be getting served loads of random consumer tech. <laughs> Sweets, Barbie dolls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think sort of to wrap this up then, I, I think the other thing I just wanted to touch on is how do you think communication is going to change? when everything goes back to normal or are we going to go back to normal? You know, it's sort of a de define what normal is going to be, isn't it? Yeah, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, I don't think uh, we're going to be going back to normal for, I don't know. I mean, if you put it based on the vaccine timeline, um, you're looking at, well, potentially a year and a half, um, yeah. basically means that I think, that, you know, this will definitely be kind of, um, you know, out in the open world, but our new norm is going to be some form of social distancing. You know, it kind of completely changes the dynamic of how, you know, humans interact because, you know, we're not going to be able to potentially go to pubs, clubs, restaurants in the same format that we did before for a long time. So it just means that I think by the very nature of what's going on at the moment, our world is becoming more digital. You know, our, our you know, our social needs is kind of, humans are still there but you know that's going to get satisfied by kind of digital interaction you know because we you know we just we are not going to be able to interact in the same way for a time and i think once it's been going on for you know a year a year and six months you know does that then just change the mentality you know our behavioral patterns and we start to kind of just act more that way because i'm sure that you know the the doomsday preppers are going to be you know kind of they're just going to continue this social distancing and just suddenly you know they're, they're going to be people aren't going to interact in the same way because they're just going to be terrified of this disease because don't forget there isn't there isn't a cure it can hit anybody you know it is predominantly older people that are affected but there's loads of cases of just you know younger people as well so it's mm -hmm. nobody really knows that's the thing and i think while that uncertainty is there you know for digital it's just going to push everything a lot more digital so yeah do you think point. do you think it's a bit like when the internet first came around that like almost like a second stage because people went from going oh i'd never talk to my best friend over email to then emailing their best friends and their colleagues habitually do you think this is like the next stage you know we, we were usually going i'd much rather meet someone in person than do a video interview but after this we may start going oh actually a video interview is actually more convenient because i save time on travel and i don't have to pay traveling expenses yeah i mean what's interesting about this current you know, period in our lives is that, you know, we have been forced to social distancing and stay home, 
but actually the technology is there to keep us in touch. Yeah, yeah. But it's not like we've had to suddenly like create something new to stay in touch. Everything's been there, but what's actually happened is people have been forced onto it. Mm -hmm. yeah. People that, you know, would never, you know, I'm looking at my, you know, my son's school, for example, you know, you've got a whole bunch of teachers, a whole bunch of kids um, who now suddenly know how Teams works, Zoom works. Um, they're quite comfortable sat there talking to a screen and doing their piano lessons, singing lessons. I mean, my kids are doing everything they would do at school just through Zoom. Mm -hmm. you know, and you've suddenly got, you know, to them, it's completely normal now to operate, you know, to function in this way. Whereas, you know, you look at anyone over... I don't know, 30, who doesn't work in an office environment, has never used Teams, never used Zoom. You know, they've never interacted in this way. There's suddenly all these apps like House Party, people streaming concerts. You know, they've just, you know, the whole population has been brought up to speed on tech that we all know and use every day, but in, you know, a five-week period. And they've all had to learn it. So it's kind of, you know it's like we were talking about brands earlier, you know, all these tools are already there for them to use, but they're now being forced onto it. So it's just, I just think that, you know, what it, it what we're experiencing now is going to continue. I mean, it will definitely kind of become a bit more relaxed, but you can't beat face-to-face -face interaction at the end of the day, whether it's through, you know, personal or business, but, you know, people aren't going to rely on kind of traveling. They're not going to, feel like they need to kind of go out as much anymore because we just but then it could also be a just massive backlash where you know for example when my local village pub opens i'm not planning to leave for about a week <laughs> no exactly yeah there, there will be a massive a massive rise in people just uh, you know running out of their homes immediately which i'm sure is what we're all going to do I, I think one of the smallest things i've noticed is um zoom calls before all this happened uh, usually when you go on a zoom call you would have no or very little video on the screen. And, and since all this, every single video is turned on on, on Zoom now. And it's, it's a really small thing I've noticed, but I think just those little changes in people's mentality of, you know what, I'd rather see a human being now. I don't just want to hide away. And it, it's making us more open to digital interaction, I think, which, which is going to be interesting as, as we move forward in the future. Yeah. I know, um, the cloud services are definitely struggling as well because um, I did a podcast yesterday with um, on my own podcast and we do it on Zoom as well. And um, I noticed the video itself normally just kind of pops up and says it's ready. Mm. It was like a good sort of hour and a half before it suddenly like processed and it was only like a sort of 20 minute video or something. Oh, wow. OK, right. So Zoom servers are obviously very full. <laughs> well, and I know Teams was dropping out every now and then because because you know, Microsoft is giving it away for free, haven't they? So that everyone can get on it. Yeah. Which is a master stroke. Um, but yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, um, does question like working methodology moving forward. I mean, because I think, again, we're going to have to, when we go back, there will probably be a form of social distancing in offices. But at the moment, we've got an office where we couldn't fit everybody in if everyone had to have a two meter square around them. Well, of course, yeah. So it's definitely going to have to introduce some kind of, you know, half in, half out sort of scenario to start with at least. Um, but again, a lot of this is vaccine dependent, isn't it? So if they get their act together and create a vaccine and suddenly we can all get cured, then everything will probably bounce back to normal. But I just don't think that's going to be the case. No, no. Do you, do you think the nice five will survive as well? What was that, sorry? Do you think the nine to five will survive as well since we're all being more flexible now? Um, yeah, I still think, uh, I mean, I'm doing a podcast on mental health next week with, um, some people from that sector. And one of the questions is about, you know, routine and, um, for sanity, people need to keep a routine. Yeah. I mean, when I originally, um, went on my own 20 years ago, the whole reason why Ranieri appeared was because I had to get out of the house and get an office to maintain some kind of structure in my life. Mm -hmm. I found that even back then I had international clients. And what I was finding was that I was starting to do calls later and later at night because they were US based, um, then getting up later, not getting changed in the daytime and then just starting to work. You know, you go into your bedroom, answer a few emails, then you realize you've been there for seven hours. Mm, yeah. And so, the, you know, the US wake up and you're having calls with them. You know, I think that nine to five thing, I think actually is, it's a, it's a very old approach to work. 
but I think people need that routine for their sanity, you know, because otherwise you just, you know, look, we're business owners, so nine to five doesn't apply to us. No. I think for most people, um, they need some structure and, you know, because the thing is as well, if you don't work nine to five, what actually happens is you start, it starts knocking onto everyone else in the organization as well. So, Mm -hmm. you know, at the moment I'm getting up, I go sit, I get up at normal time. I sit down at my desk, but I'm an hour and a half earlier than I normally am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the same at night. And what's actually happening is we're starting to answer emails, which is encouraging other people to answer those emails. And then suddenly, you know, you've got people working hours that, you know, and the whole basis of employment and how people get paid and all that kind of stuff is structured around that time frame. So, and I just, I just think from a mental health point of view, I think people should work to some kind of structure because otherwise you just never turn off and that is not great for mental health. So, yeah, that's interesting because I'm having, I'm filming another episode with a, with a mental health um, psychologist in an hour's time. So I'll, I'll float a few of these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's literally, I've got back to back. I've got two today. Um, so yeah, I'll float a few of these questions with him next. Yeah, no, cool. Yeah, well, I'm speaking to um, the CEO of Calm. So the yes, uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. So um, very interesting. We've got uh, John from the editor of PR Week. So we're kind of focusing it around agency mental health. So for, as in staff of agencies and like what they're going through at the moment. Mm. Obviously, you've got you know at the moment, especially you've got people kind of not used to working at home and kind of probably feeling already quite. Um, anxious about just the fact that they're working at home can they still do their job you know you've got all this uncertainty in the market and it's just you know i think people need to maintain that sense of normality yeah definitely Um, you know because they're just going to crack up otherwise (laughs) (laughs) yeah i agree okay well um yeah we've probably we've hit the hour mark there actually so i mean unless you've got anything else in particular um you'd like to share i think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there Yeah, then just, yeah, thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. It's fun. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure.